couple of things I want to say at the, at the outset here is uh, I was at a bar last night with a couple of their lipedema physicians and colleagues, and uh, somebody that will remain nameless did spill a drink. That's number one. And number two, nobody checked my Baden score last night at the bar. Okay. All right, so uh, I was asked to talk on hybrid limb swelling as well as uh, the title says livid discoloration. And uh, I've spoken on both these topics before. So now, so the first topic is on hybrid types of lipedema. That is lipedema of mixed character, that is composed of mixed parts. Now, important you keep in mind, I'm going to reiterate this at the end, that when we're talking about hybrid limb swelling in the setting of lipedema, that lipedema remains a predominant cause of the hybrid limb swelling. And uh, let's review some data from our institution that has finally been submitted. Uh, I'll tell you when it's in, or somebody will tell you when it's finally in publication. Uh, this is from our, uh, our Physical Therapy Lymphedema Center, and where we looked at 440 patients that had lymphedema. Now note that 52, or 12% of these, had associated lipedema. All 52 of these lipedema patients had transient or fixed foot swelling. 90% of them, in fact, had fixed foot swelling, only 10% for transient. So the majority of these patients had stage two or stage three lymphedema in association with their lipedema. So bottom line, all of these patients had lymph lipedema plus lymphedema, also known as lipolymphedema. Now, let's just review some of the clinical features. Dr. Bartholomew did a good uh, job on this. Uh, in earlier classic lipedema, the feet are spared of permanent swelling. We're all taught that. But yet, as I told you in our series, 90% of these patients exhibited permanent foot swelling. Well, why do you think that is? I think a couple of reasons why. So there is a typical representation of a patient that was referred to our lymphedema center with lipedema plus lymphedema. Number one, there was clearly a selection bias. That is, patients had the most severe lipedema with secondary lymphedema were more likely to be referred in for therapy. Shouldn't be that way, but I think that explains it. Disease duration, the mean age of the lipedema cohort was 56. So these patients had had lipedema for a while. The longer you have it, the more likely you are to develop lymphedema. And finally, the weight. A BMI was pretty uh, significantly elevated at 48.2. And as Dr. Herb said and Dr. Bartholomew, when you gain weight, you're more likely to have secondary lymphedema in the setting of lipedema. Now, important you recognize that patients with lipedema and lymphedema, also known as lipolymphedema, typically have minimal to modest amount of foot swelling as seen here in this lipolymphedematous patient. And here's a patient of mine with rather pronounced stage three lobular lipedema, and yet really has a, a, just a minimal amount of foot swelling. So that's typically what you're going to see. You're not going to see a lot of foot swelling. So if you ever see a lot of foot swelling, this dorsal prominence, a buffalo hump, as you will, that's something we typically see in what we would refer to as a primary lymphedema. Look at that buffalo hump there. That you should not see in the setting of lipedema. And uh, what do you think about that there, Dr. Bartholomew? Looks like an ankle cuff sign there, right? And that's why I say the ankle cuff, yeah. That's why I say the ankle cuff sign is not pathognomonic of lipedema. It only is in the, in the absence of foot swelling. But you can get a very pronounced cuff in the setting of primary lymphedema from the associated secondary fat deposition. You should not see this in lipolymphedema. So let's review these hybrids for our institution, all these 52 patients. Now, keep in mind, all of these had associated lymphedema, so they were all hybrids by definition. The first group, 22 of them, simply had lipedema with lymphedema. Now, look at this. 21 patients had associated chronic venous insufficiency. There's another one with chronic venous insufficiency with cancer and cancer surgery. And there's another one uh, that had, there were four of them that had lipedema with chronic venous insufficiency and surgery. Now, 50% of these hybrids had associated chronic venous insufficiency. That's a remarkable number. 50% of these lipedema hybrids had associated chronic venous insufficiency and lymphedema as well. Now this is interesting that seven of these patients had a hybrid of worsening non-cancer related surgery. What do you think the, that surgery was that provoked their secondary lymphedema? Knee replacement surgery. I bet there's people in here that have had uh, knee replacement surgery and developed worsening lymphedema after the surgery. So here's a great representation of lipolymphedema. We've got a wrinkle cuff sign, a little lateral medial fat pad sign. The swelling is relatively modest. Another example, great example, of one of the 52 patients that had lipedema with lymphedema in our cohort. 
Now here's, uh, so what people say, well, what radiographic evidence do you have that lymphedema uh, or lipedema causes lymphedema? Well, here are two uh, good studies. There's a 2009 reference looking at uh, MRI imaging in the setting of pure lipedema, so no obvious secondary lymphedema. The lymphatic vessels were actually di dilated, but there was no associated reflux or obstruction of their lymphatic system. Now they looked at, they had a subset of 16 patients that had lipedema with clinically manifest lymphedema. The lymphatic vessels were dilated, but they were also obstructed and there was evidence of lymphatic dermal reflux. So all 16 lower extremities with clinically manifest lipolymphedema exhibited abnormal MR imaging. Here's a 2018 reference utilizing lymphocentigraphy, radionuclide lymphocentigraphy injected into the leg. And these were a cohort of patients that only had pure lipedema, so they had no clinically manifest secondary lymphedema, and yet half of them had abnormal imaging. So this lymphedema is occurring early, even if it's not clinically manifest, lymphedema is playing a role in the associated swelling that complicates lipedema. And note that the BMI of this cohort was only about 30. Can you imagine if they were doing it in my cohort, I suspect that number would be a lot higher. So what do we have here? Uh, Great example of lipedema. You see the uh, symmetrical fatty deposition, the very loose, lax skin, the mattressing phenomenon, if you will. We see just a minimal amount of foot swelling. There's a wrinkle cuff sign. And what do we see here? Venous stasis hyperpigmentation. I find it, so this is a great example of the 50% of the patients that had lipedema with chronic venous insufficiency and, lipid, and lymphedema. And it's fascinating, when you review the literature on lipedema, you'll see photographs of legs that look just like this. Nobody mentions the associated chronic venous insufficiency. I think Dr. McCutch didn't mention this. There's just nothing in the literature about it. And uh, this is a great reference. This is the, one of the a seminal reference on lipedema, which some of you are probably aware of. Dr. Wold's famous article, I know well, Polly Armour is definitely familiar with this. Uh, Lipedema of the Legs, published by Dr. Wold and his associates back at the, the Mayo Clinic in 1951. So clearly our retro references, you will. But look at this, 5% of these patients had venous mediated indurated skin discoloration and 2.5% had skin ulceration. So it was reported all the way back in 1951, but good luck finding this in the literature at present. Thank you, Polly. <laughs> Inside joke with that, actually. Uh, so here's another great example of uh, lipedema complicated by chronic venous insufficiency and lymphedema. But what's different about this case? You see the swelling primarily localized to the thigh. There's uh, an absence of an ankle cuff sign. But you see the copious venous stasis hyperpigmentation. So this is lipophlebolymphedema of the type 2 or upper leg distribution. And my last singular example of lipedema complicated by chronic venous insufficiency and lymphedema would be this remarkable case where you see the fatty swelling, symmetrical fatty swelling with lobules up in the thighs and the upper calves. But look at that peculiar upside down bowling pin appearance to the lower limbs consists in what we refer to as lipodermatosclerosis. That's chronic fibrosis and scarring of the lower part of the leg that causes that uh, atrophic appearance. So in conclusion, uh, keep in mind that all of the patients in our cohort, this will be out here in the literature soon, had lymphedema with associated lymphedema. So all of them had this. And also keep in mind that reference I showed you of the pure lipedema, where 50% of those had abnormal lymphocentigraphy. So this association, again, is occurring early at an occult stage. And then 50% of our population that referred also had associated chronic venous insufficiency. It continues to baffle me how it doesn't show up in the literature. And also keep in mind, critically important, that lipidema remains a predominant cause of hybrid limb swelling. And this is where Dr. McCutcheon's lecture was so helpful because you'll see providers that will tell you by ablating or fixing your saphenous veins that your limb swelling is going to get considerably better. Unfortunately, that's not the case. It may help some skin changes, but if you're doing it to help limb swelling, it's probably not going to help. All right, so we're going to go on and switch gears here, completely switch gears, and talk about lipedema and vasospastic disease, a livid association. I, I'm sorry I gave this last year, but again, blame it on Cheyenne. She asked me to give it again. <laughs> All right, no relevant disclosures when talking about cold limbs. That's a little bit tough. Uh, so what was the genesis for me creating this talk on lipedema and vasospastic disease? 
This, you'll notice here lipidimidous legs, but you see that reddish blue discoloration in the lower parts of the calves and the feet. I mean, where did this even, where did this come about? Well, it all came about from Dr. Erb's very, very informative webpage where I was scrolling down, this is about six years ago, and I was looking through her uh, criteria, and she'd added this adjunctive criteria for what defines lipidema, and I clued into number eight where she referenced the hypothermia of the skin. So I thought, that's really interesting because I read a lot about lipidema and yet I've never seen that before. Where is she getting this data? And I did a database review and I couldn't find anything. Uh, and then yet finally, it, just uh, two years ago in this uh, uh, best practice guidelines on lipidema for the United Kingdom, there was a reference to cooler than unaffected areas when talking about the skin and lipidema. But other than that, I couldn't find anything. And then on a really deep dive, of the literature, uh, I did find this excellent review article from the British Dur uh, Journal of Dermatology in 2009, and they referenced the following. This is a subtype of lipedema they referenced in this article. The type Rusticanus moncors is associated with erythrocyanosis, so red-blue discoloration of the legs. So that got me wondering. And then I, I thought, well, that's a peculiar term, type Rusticanus moncor. Where does that come from? So I punched that in. I did a literature search and I, I got this, this uh, hit from the Archives of Dermatology in Syphilis from 1940. Uh, and you can see here it was Dr. Moncor's article, Experimental Investigations in Acrocyanosis, and, and they recognized three cardinal features of this type Rusticanus Moncor. Number one, more serious complaints at a younger age. Number two, dull spontaneous leg pain, which is worse at the end of the day, suggestive of chronic venous insufficiency, and they stated without varicose veins. What does that sound like? That sounds like loss of the veno-arterial reflux that's leading to the associated orthostatic edema. And then finally, the third component was erythrocyanosis curum polarum. When you break that down, it's red-blue legs in the setting of girls or women. So then I had to say, okay, let's punch in erythrocyanosis curum polarum and see what shows up. And the only thing I could find was this 1925 reference from Dr. Klingmuller, and here is what defines erythrocyanosis curum polarum. It's a variant of acrocyanosis with cushion-like swellings of the legs, the currents common in girls and women. So I would submit to you that this 1925 reference by Dr. Klingmuller was probably the initial reference to lipedema. I really think that's what it is. Now, this is what's really gonna surprise you. I mean, I, I gotta give it up to Dr. Klingmuller for recognizing this, but Look at the cause of this, the risk factors. Short skirts and obesity, that in mind. Uh, the etiology, uh, greatly developed layer of fat protects the internal organs but exposes the skin above it to the effects of cold. Dr. Bartholomew referenced that. I'm not convinced that's it, but it could be. But clinically, Dr. Klingmer was spot on. Erythrocyanosis may extend from the inner thigh and knee to the ankle, and he also described a livid bluish discoloration of skin separated by a blurred edge. That's levito reticularis. So here's a great example. I mean, you see patients in the office with uh, lipedema, and you clue in on their leg swelling, but really nobody pays attention to that discoloration within their feet, the acrocyanotic feet. Look at that. You can see the discoloration not only with the feet, it goes all the way up to the knee level. So again, you focus in on the leg swelling, but you don't pay attention to the cutaneous hypothermia with acrocyanosis. And, and I really like the term erythrocyanosis better because it's not cyanosis meaning blue, it's more of a red-blue discoloration that you see. And we use the term acrocyanosis in the non-lipidemitous literature, and they would be feet that look like this. You shouldn't see that in the setting of lipedema. So what am I showing you here? This poor woman fell in ripped her jeans, but you can see the net-like reticular discoloration consistent with libido reticularis. Great example of li libido reticularis. And this is what's amazing. I, I find this slide completely, this is one of my patients, that note that the livid, libido or the livid discoloration, it parallels the distribution of the fat because you only see it up in the, in the thighs. You don't see it down in the calves in this type two or upper leg variant of lipedema. Here's an example of some uh, patellar livido reticularis combined with acrocyanosis. And I just show this to emphasize that both of these occur not uncommonly in, in the lipidema patient. They have acrocyanosis or erythrocyanosis. They also have livido reticularis. You, you should see both. Now that begets the question, well, why do these patients with lipidema have associated livido reticularis and erythrocyanosis? 
Well, you try to look it up and there's a big black hole when it comes to evidence. But this is a really good article. It's, it's an incredibly detailed article entitled Pathophysiologic Dilemmas of Lipedema by Dr. Sell and cohorts. And I'm just gonna briefly encapsulate this and state that due to abnormalities in the brain stem, patients have associated inflammation of the sympathetic sensory nerves and more importantly, an associated peripheral neuropathy. In fact, they refer to this as a lipidemitous neuropathy lipidemitous neuropathy. Now keep in mind, this neuropathy is not your typical peripheral neuropathy you're gonna pick up with an electromyogram or an EMG study. So if you, you're complaining about this, your doctor gets an EMG, you're not gonna find a positive study because this is of the small fibers. You have to do a different type of test. So when you have a small fiber neuropathy, uh, as well as an autonomic nervous system dysfunction, what are the characteristic clinical signs and symptoms? Because these are uh, well documented in the literature. Well, when you have a small fiber neuropathy, you have associated, the term is neurogenic vasodysregulation. That is, nerves regulate the tone of the cutaneous blood vessels. So when they're dysfunctional, the cutaneous blood vessels become dysfunctional, and you develop manifestations such as erythrocyanosis, which is quite common in the lipedema population. Raynaud phenomenon, where you get transiently cold, blue, or white toes, uh, it can happen, but it's relatively rare. Libido reticularis, very common. And then finally, here's a patient of mine that has a small fiber neuropathy and associated with her lipedema, and she actually gets intermittently burning hot feet, which is a disorder we refer to as erythromyalgia. You see her feet are actually red and burning hot. Now she'll switch back and forth between cold and hot feet, which is very uh, characteristic of erythromyalgia. That is actually rare. Um, so let's again do a deep dive into acrocyanosis. Great article by Dr. Kuklinski and associates from the Mayo Clinic. And let's go through each one of these causes of acrocyanosis. That's only a joke. Actually, I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna hone in here on the heritable diseases, specifically Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Well, what do we know about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? Well, because of Dr. Herb's phenomenal work she's done in the, uh, the lipedema population, she's identified that half of all lipedema patients have a Baden score of five or greater. And that begets the question, what percentage of those actually have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which we know is in the differential of acrocyanosis. And we know that when you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome of the hypermobile type, which is probably the most common type to complicate lipedema, you can get the following disorders. Swelling and or discoloration, a dusky purple reddish discoloration in the legs after standing for only a relatively short period of time. Sound familiar? Peripheral vasoconstriction, cold, dusky hands and feet. So I think therein lies the link. So what does this all mean? Do lipedema patients with vasospastic disease have more limb swelling? I'm not sure. Did, are they of, of higher weight? I'm really not sure. I do think these patients have more leg pain, which was referenced in that previous uh, Moncor uh, reference I gave you. And uh, do they have more hypermobility? I think they do. And we'll just await more research from uh, Dr. Erbs and her colleagues on this. And I thank you for your attention. One minute left. Thank you.